So this is a talk, um, <coughs> it's kind of a, a case study of using uh, GIS tools to characterize the ExoMars 2018 rover candidate landing sites. Um, and just a, a mention to all the co-authors that are involved in this, um, this is the UK ExoMars landing site consortium. Um, and there's, there's a few of us working on a few different things, but um, I'm really focused on just one of the sites right now, so I'll use that as a, a case study. Um, so there are four sites currently being considered. Um, this is Hippanis Vallis. All the sites are ancient fluvial terrains. Uh, they tend to be towards the dichotomy boundary. Um, and this is really kind of a, a, a GIS context. So this is a geologic map produced in ARC by Peter Forden. Um, and this is the nominal 2018 landing ellipse as it stands between the Hippanis Delta and the Sabrina Delta over here on the left. Um, <clears throat> so just a, a kind of mention of what you can get uh, just off the bat. So one of the first and easiest things to do is photogeology, where you can just use visible imagery from a variety of instruments on a variety of missions um, to determine lots of things about the terrain you're looking at. Uh, and specifically with regard to the science questions, you can look at things like fluvial landforms to look at the channel precedence, energy of the deposition environment, flow rate, ponding, uh, the stratigraphy, the erosional habit, crater retention age by counting craters, Terrain softening, things like dust cover or thermal inertia can tell you stuff about whether the material is soft enough for the rover to move, move over or not. Uh, there's distribution of slopes. This depends on the availability of uh, stereo terrain models, which are now widely abundant thanks to the stellar efforts of HRIC, HiRISE, and other teams. Um, and just also, I mentioned that Cassis on the trace gas orbiter will also provide a stereo DTM. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so how do we go about doing these kind of systematic surveys of features and contacts over the landing sites? Um, well, I found it easiest to make a grid. Uh, so you make a regular grid uh, in whatever projection you're in, uh, which ensures that you've counted everything and missed nothing, uh, which is good if you want to be thorough for choosing landing sites. Um, there's a handy arc extension that I found just called generate a repeating pattern of shapes. Um, it also does hexagons and, and other shapes, um, but it's very useful for things like this. Um, just a mention of the different kinds of data. So visible data can give you quite a lot of information uh, if you're doing photogeology, but thermal data uh, available from <coughs> instruments like Themis um, or MGS Tess can also tell you a lot. And thermal data gives you a lot of secondary products as well. Um, so other quantities like rock abundance or the deposit of... Uh, the thickness of a sand deposit or the degree of induration, uh, the grain size or the dust coverage. These are all things that have been inferred from thermal data. Um, and interestingly, there's a lot of these that are constrained when choosing landing sites. So this is the, uh, these are the figures taken from the uh, advisory document. It was kind of a landing site uh, user manual issued by ESA and Ross Cosmos in 2013, telling you the, the rough um, quantities that uh, you need to kind of satisfy, um, including thermal inertia, albedo, rock abundance, and dust cover. And these are not well that constrained. Um, on the right is just an example of uh, thermal inertia derived for a sulfate mound in Juventus Chasma. And in this case, it's very obvious that the visible data, this is um, albedo up here, I guess, uh, or this is HRIC in the deer channel, so predominantly an albedo signal. Um, and then this is thermal inertia at the bottom. But you can see that it quite well correlates with uh, stratigraphy, but in some cases that's not always obvious. You might have a completely flat sand sheet here and there might be structure in the thermal data. And we actually see that quite a lot for uh, the Hippanis Delta. This is a stretch of some nighttime Themis imagery, um, and it's kind of a weird stretch, the red-blue. Apologies for that. But the thing I wanted to highlight is the Hippanis Delta over here. In visible images, you can't see this structure, um, but this kind of texture might be related to anastomosing channels in a, in a deltaic environment, or some other feature, um, maybe due to erosion. But the point is, thermal data is important when doing any kind of characterization because it shows things you wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise see. And I'm sure you get the same if we had radar data too, although I haven't delved into that yet. But what does this actually tell us? So the thermal signature is responsive only to the thermal skin depth if you're looking at the difference between day and night brightness temperatures. And so on a diurnal time scale, that really corresponds to the top maybe 10 centimeters. This is a plot for a few typical materials. And you can see that the variety of depths is not actually that big. So you're really looking on diurnal time scales 
at only the top few tens of centimetres. Um, and that's definitely a consideration that needs to be made when looking at thermal data because that might not correspond to the underlying geology, just the, the overlying overburden sand or dust. Uh, another thing that people do a lot of, it seems, is crater counting. So there are many tools available for this. Um, and I've just found the easiest is circles as polygons in a shapefile. Um, it's only two clicks to make them in Arc, for example. And you can fairly easily convert a shapefile to something that's readable by a program that deals with uh, crater size frequency distributions and does statistics for you, like the very helpful Crater Stats 2. Um, and I've written a, a Python program that does that conversion if anyone needs it. This PDF is on the website if anyone finds that useful. Um, what's often useful is to figure out a crater retention age. And you can do that per geologic unit uh, with this um, handy extraction by polygon. So if you've made a geologic map, you can take your crater distribution and just separate them by a geologic unit. And that gives you uh, an attribute table of points instead of circles. But that's fine because all you want really is the diameter or radius and their location. And then using this information, you can plot different crater size frequency distributions versus isochrons in the crater stats too. I'm not sure if Gregory Michael is here, but thank you for that program. Um, and then, then that gives you science results. So really this, this talk was kind of meant as a, as a summary of what I'm doing and also to provoke discussion if people know better ways of doing these things. This is kind of a, a case study. Um, another thing I've done quite a lot of is mapping aeolian bed forms. So here's an example from another different landing site, Aram Dorsum. Um, and this initial study was done by Matt Baum at the Open University. And the idea was to quantify the amount of soft material or soft terrain within the landing ellipse. Um, that could potentially impede the traverse of a rover. If there was soft material on the surface, you'd want to avoid it. If there were topographic obstacles, you'd want to avoid them. So making maps of these features is paramount. And it was something that was requested by the landing site selection working group. So we went about surveying them. Um, and the idea was to go across a kind of systematic grid and then map the areas where you could see these features and then classify them as um, it's some arbitrary classification scheme, but the one we went with was kind of a traffic light scheme. So red is most dangerous, yellow is closely spaced, and green is widely spaced. Maybe you could get a rover through it. So we mapped these, these features. Uh, these are not dunes. They're actually transverse aeolian ridges. Um, but the same process could be applied to all aeolian features. So we have this landing ellipse and uh, a not yet well-constrained 2020 landing <coughs> ellipse, or it's more of a bow tie. Um, we can map these areas that have these features. And actually, as a result of this process, we ended up moving the nominal 2018 ellipse a little bit further north to avoid this. Um, and the idea is that you classify them as either active or inactive. So the solid colors are places where we thought they were probably moving around today because they were made of darker material or there were differences between images or, um, uh, or something like that. Um, or if you had a, a non-solid color, um, they were probably inactive. Uh, transverse aeolian ridges are often quite light compared to dark dunes. So you could say that maybe they're lithified and not active. Nevertheless, they still present a hazard for a rover <coughs> because they are topographic obstacles. And then you can quantify that kind of thing on the grid and end up with some aerial fraction coverage by <coughs> early in features. Uh, and in this case, it was relatively simple because every grid was filled with a fraction of shapes. Um, the image coverage was complete, and so you had 100% image, and all you had was a percentage of coverage by the polygons. A slightly more tricky case was using high-rise images because the high-rise image footprint doesn't cover um, the entire uh, mapping area. So you end up with a, a, non, uh, a, a footprint that doesn't align with grid lines, which means you have to multiply the result by the fraction of the grid cell that each polygon occupies. But it's possible, and you end up with a grid like this that gives you very similar answers. And the idea is that you could resolve smaller features in high-rise images than you can with uh, the previous example, which was CTX resolution. Uh, another, another quantity we try to derive is the, the mean slope. This is something that's often requested by engineers because it helps you determine 
uh, you know, how rough the terrain is going to be when you land, what the radar reflectivity is going to be like, things like that. So a very simple way is to just do some thresholding. So you calculate the slope over a digital terrain model, and then you exclude the grid cells where the average slope is larger, and you end up with a kind of map of exclusion zones where you can't, it wouldn't be necessarily that safe to land. One important thing is that slope is calculated over a baseline. And that means that it's the, these grid cells are each um, this baseline long. And so slope distribution is a function of baseline length. And so ESA defined this way of calculating uh, slope as a function of baseline, and you end up with a plot like this. So everywhere on the lower left is safe for the rover, everywhere on the upper right is less safe. But the problem with constraining the slope within the landing ellipse is that you need to use quite a lot of different terrain models because they're all different resolutions. So high rise can sample everything. Molar cannot sample the finer details than a few hundred meters. So you really need to take into account all the terrain models that you have um, and be aware of uh, the processing that goes into making them and how, how uh, down sampled they are from the original measurements. So really, just to summarize, there are lots of different things that need to be done to characterize a landing site or any terrain uh, for the purposes of, of science or, or engineering. And really, there's a lot of different ways I'm sure you can do these things. And the idea is really just to provoke discussion on what is the best way, or is there, a, is there an accepted best way, or are there many options? Uh, am I doing it wrong? Please tell me if, if you think so. Um, from a science perspective, geologic mapping is probably the, the first and most important thing to do. Um, spectral analysis, I haven't mentioned any CRISM or Omega measurements here, but we've been doing that too. Um, the current best way, it seems, to use CRISM data is with the NV CRISM analysis tool plugin. Um, it doesn't seem to play very well with ArcMap, for example. Um, and I've had some conversion issues, but if anyone's aware of a, a better option, please let me know. Uh, crater counting seems to be fairly doable with Arc and Crater Stats too, the IDL program, but maybe they're a good alternative. Um, and something I haven't really touched on, but we do have to do before selecting a landing site is traverse planning. You have to provide some example science traverses the rover might do. And at the moment, I'm just thinking about doing a, a radial buffer uh, from a site or a geologic contact. And maybe there are more, more appropriate ways. From an engineering perspective, you need to know the rock abundance. And we literally have to count every rock within the ellipse, as I'm sure many of you know, um, but that will take time. Automated counting doesn't seem to be really mature enough, but there is some scope to do comparisons between human counts and automated counts, <coughs> and then compare both of those to rock abundance models. Um, slopes as a function of baseline length. We have a, a program or a, a, a tool in ARC to calculate many baseline lengths uh, or slope distributions over many baseline lengths and then give an overall curve, but maybe there's a program that already does this uh, and it could be more efficient because ours is kind of thrown together. Um, the terrain hazard mapping, uh, so blocky or aeolian features need to be counted, and they could be counted in an automated way similar to rocks, um, but we haven't yet found a program that does that convincingly. Um, and similarly for craters, there's nothing that I've seen that really counts craters uh, in a... In a reliable enough way to be used for landing site characterization. And then all of these other things that are derived from uh, thermal data, like dust coverage or rock abundance, um, who knows how, how well constrained they are. I mean, you can read the literature, but maybe, maybe there are better options. And radar re reflectivity is something I haven't even touched on yet. Um, I'm not, I don't think I'm really expected to do it. Um, perhaps that's more of an engineering thing. Uh, but if anyone knows anything about how to calculate uh, model radar ref reflectivity from a terrain, that would be great. Uh, thanks very much. That's everything. <laughs>